Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mark Milwee, Trinity, Alabama, Mount View Baptist Church. <clears throat> We're here again today to uh, talk about Pathway to Maturity, and today I want to talk about the subject of the heart. Uh, in, in Scripture, the words heart, thoughts, mind, or affections speak about what's inside of us. Therefore, uh, what we are or do daily will be greatly determined by what we allow into our heart. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the objective of this lesson is to help us understand the significance of what we uh, allow in, in, in our heart. And so I thank you for watching uh, today. Uh, it, you know, I, I made a commitment when, when this all started that I was going to do a, a Bible lesson every day, uh, Monday through Friday, until we're able to go back to church. And so... Uh, this has lasted a little longer than I thought it would, but that's okay. Uh, we still have a few folks watching, and I appreciate your faithfulness. And so uh, we're going to jump in today and, and talk about the heart. Often in our culture today, you hear the admonition, well, just follow your heart. And it sounds so good and so right. In other words, if you're looking for direction, if you're looking for answers, if, if you're looking for your best life now, then the most common advice is just to follow the desires of your heart. Uh, let me give you an example. You, you can be watching uh, any Hallmark movie or, or, or basically any television show that, that's come out you know, in recent years, and, and the scene will unfold like this. Someone is trying to make a big, big decision, and their friend or their mentor will say, well, what is your heart telling you to do? The, the idea seems to be that you, you should just follow your heart because your heart will never lead you astray. However, what I want to point out today as we get started is this is dramatically different from the advice that the Bible gives. Specifically in the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 17, verse 9, the Bible says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Some translations even say the heart is desperately wicked. So if God's word says that your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, then do we really think that it's such great advice to just follow your heart? Our heart or our emotions can lead us into all the wrong places, which is why we need to check our motives and clarify our thinking which is exactly what the verse that follows this well-known verse tells us to do. Jeremiah 17 verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. So you might want to follow your heart. Uh, you, you might want to heed this advice uh, that that the words that the world so often uh, gives, but according to God's word, uh, that's not the best thing to do. The Bible says God is searching our heart and examining our mind. God wants to know our true motives, our underlying intentions, and His word says that He will reward us according to what our deeds deserve. In fact, I find it very interesting to see what led Jeremiah to say these things. So if you look back up to verse 1 of Jeremiah 17, you'll see that the text says, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. With a point of diamond, it is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. So instead of being full of wisdom, Jeremiah says that the tablet of their heart is filled with sin. He specifically says this sin is written with a pen of iron engraved with a diamond point. This simply means that their sin is so ingrained that it gone down into the depths of their being and even defiled their altars. Now drop down to verse 5 and notice what he says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from God. So Jeremiah says that our heart is filled with sin and cursed is the man who trusts in his own flesh for strength because more often than not, now listen to me, more often than not, our heart is leading us away from the Lord. However, we encounter a sharp contrast when we get to verse 7. 
Jeremiah 17 still, verse 7. But blessed is the man, listen, who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. This is almost identical to the passage I shared in my message yesterday from Psalm 1. Psalm 1 verse 1 begins by saying, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on that law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. So what can we learn from all this background material? Well, number one, we can learn that more often than not, our heart is filled with sin. <laughs> and number two, accursed is the man that depends upon it. But in sharp contrast, that we learn that we are blessed when we trust in the Lord and delight in his word, that we will be like trees planted by streams of water, that we will always bear fruit. Our leaves will never wither because our roots are drawing strength from the stream and we will prosper and not have to worry because we are connected to the living water. So the bottom line today is that instead of following our heart, which is deceitful and desperately wicked and filled with sin, we should follow the word of God and do what it is telling us to do. So we should plant our lives by the stream of living water, uh, allow our roots to, to go down deep and soak up this life-giving nourishment. The Bible says that those who do this will be blessed. They'll be nourished. They'll be strengthened. They'll be prosperous because our delight is in the law of the Lord. And on that law, we are thinking or, or meditating day and night. Therefore, when it comes to making big decisions and life-altering choices, we need to be looking into God's Word for direction and wisdom and wise spiritual advice. You're not going to find that in your heart. You're going to only find that in God's Word. This is why the psalmist says, Search me, O God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, in the Bible, the heart is described as being the seat of the will and the emotions. Therefore, we need to guard it carefully. In fact, Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. I actually like the way this verse is rendered in the Good News translation. It says, be careful how you think, because your life is shaped by your thoughts. And we're reminded in Proverbs 23.7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Therefore, we've got to be vigilant to guard what enters our heart. We have to be careful how we think about things. We have to understand that what we allow into our mind uh, molds and shapes us into the people we're becoming. We need to cultivate a heart from God that will squeeze out other things of life. I think that's really what this verse is, is talking about. I, 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 if we'll fall in love with Jesus and desire to have more and more of him. For instance, have a clean heart, a pure heart, a heart that earnestly seeks after God, a, a, a heart that asks God to search us and reveal any offensive way and to get rid of it. Then as we're filled up more and more with Jesus, then we'll have a greater desire to be more and more like him and less and less like the world. This is why the psalmist writes, again, search me, O God, and know my heart. This is why the writer of Proverbs says, keep your heart with all vigilance. And this is why David says in Psalm 51, 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I once heard a pastor say that David was a great man of God, but David was also a great sinner. And we all know that David uh, was a man who struggled with sin. If you look carefully at your Bible, almost all translations have a heading over Psalm 51 that says, David wrote this psalm following his sin with Bathsheba. More specifically, he wrote this psalm after being confronted about his sin with Bathsheba by Nathan the prophet. You could easily say that his problem started in his heart. It began with his lust for Bathsheba, and then his scheming, planning, and actual orchestration of a plan to get him out of the problem that living out his fantasies had caused for him. 
Therefore, David knew firsthand the trouble that, that can come from allowing your life to be shaped by impure thoughts and actions. That This sin is what caused God to declare that the sword would never depart from his house, but David is also described in Scripture as a man after God's own heart. He knew where to turn when his life was reeling out of control. He prays and asks God to create in me a clean heart. He also is the one who wrote the passage we, we looked at a moment ago, which said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So David had learned to depend upon the Holy Spirit in times of trouble. He writes in Psalm 139, 7, Where can I go from your presence? Uh, excuse me, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? So you may think it's hopeless to win this battle for your heart. You may have given up long ago trying to win this battle, but we see in the example of David, a man who struggled in this area of his life, but a man who also knew where to turn when the pressure was on. God doesn't want you to live a life of guilt or defeat when it comes to this struggle. He wants you to have victory in this and every area of your life. Listen, you can win this battle. In fact, Jesus addresses this topic in Mark chapter 7. He is talking about the fact that, that, that it's not the external, what people see, but the internal that's really important in life. In other words, it's what's in your heart that really makes all the difference. And to illustrate this, he tells a simple parable. Mark 7, beginning verse 14. And he called the people to him, and he said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defiles him. So once they get alone, uh, the disciples ask for clarification. I mean, you've got to understand that uh, these things, uh, the disciples, uh, these are things they've been taught all their lives. And, and for instance, they might not have been going through the prescribed ritual for washing their hands in the appropriate way, but you can be sure they were familiar with the practice and, and they probably felt a little guilty about not doing it. But notice what Jesus says to them. And when they entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? The text says, thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. So once again, Jesus is saying that it's what's in the heart, what's inside, that makes all the difference. And then he gives a whole list of these evil things that, that can come out of a heart with, with their thoughts in the wrong place. And just to illustrate how hard it is for even the disciples to break with these traditions that they had grown up with, uh, one of my commentaries pointed out that several years later, it's clear in Acts 10, that Peter is still following the tradition of not eating anything that was not kosher, even though Jesus in this passage clearly declares all foods clean. You might recall this was when Peter had his vision of the sheep that was let down from heaven, and it's filled with all kind of animals, both clean and unclean. And the angel of the Lord says to Peter in, in Acts chapter 10, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter responds by saying, no, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And of course, this is at least a couple of years after Jesus gave this parable in Peter's presence. But this just goes to show how easy it is uh, to stay with your routine and, and you know, uh, not break away from your traditions. But we must never elevate tradition over Scripture. Therefore, here, here's what I believe it all boils down to. It takes more than belief to change our heart. It takes conviction. Now, let me repeat that. It takes more than belief to change our heart. It takes conviction. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to read Josh McDowell's book, Beyond Belief to Convictions. I would highly recommend that book to anyone that's interested in this subject. 
I believe this is really what Jesus is talking about in this passage. Let me give you some examples. For instance, anyone can say, I believe, but a conviction runs much, much deeper. Let's just use Jesus' example. Uh, anyone can say, I believe, that what you eat does not defile you. But a conviction causes you to do something about it. I'm sure that Peter believed Jesus when Jesus said that what enters your mouth does not defile you. But, this con but his conviction was still not to eat anything unclean until he had this vision from heaven that convinced him to do otherwise. Let me give you a few other examples. Anybody can say, I believe the Bible when it, when it says forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, uh, that this means that church attendance is very important. But a conviction causes you to get up out of bed and get to church on Sunday morning. I can say I believe uh, in tithing, but, but a conviction causes me to make the sacrifices to actually tithe. I can say that I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It's our guidebook for living, but it takes conviction to convince you to reject this nonsense about listening to your heart and looking into the Bible for wisdom and guidance. I could go on and on with these types of illustrations, but you get the point. The scribes and the Pharisees were so concerned about appearing righteous but it's much more important to actually be righteous. A hypocrite is someone that says one thing and then does something else. I pray that God will help us to live our lives so that our life matches our words. Uh, Warren Wiersbe in his commentary uh, has a great chart uh, about this that kind of summarizes what we're talking about uh, today. Under man's tradition, it says, man's tradition focuses on outward forms and it leads to bondage. Uh, man's tradition focuses on trifling rules and outward piety and, and neglects the word of God. But God's truth, on the other hand, focuses on an inward faith, what's in the heart that leads to freedom. It focuses on fundamental principles, on inward holiness, and lifts up and exalts the word of God. Let, let me add one more. Man's tradition focuses on listening to the heart, but God's truth focuses on looking into the Word and seeing what it says. The Bible again says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure who can understand it. So the next time you're trying to make a big decision in your life and somebody says to you, well, what's your heart telling you to do? You might want to say to them, well, I don't trust what my heart's saying. I'm going to look in God's Word and see what it advises me to do. And you'll be much further down the road by listening to the Word of God. Amen. Well, amen. Thanks for joining me today. God bless you.